Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined by Terry Robinson, and today on Tomes of Magic, we are going to be digging deep into the Corpus Hermeticum to look at Order of Hermes Tradition Book Revised. But before we get into it, Terry, were there any announcements today? You mentioned digging into the Corpus Hermeticum. And oh boy, I don't know if you've ever actually tried to do that, but it is a doozy. There is a podcast called The Secret History of Western Esotericism that dives into the Corpus Humanicum at a very superficial level. And uh, a fan reached out to me and said, hey, have you talked to this person before? And I'm like, no. So I, I started looking into it a little bit and I reached out to the person who does it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm having trouble kind of making heads or tails of it. And I was talking to one of the other fans. I got a response from the Austin who's like, hey, I'm not really familiar with what Mage is or what a role-playing game is, for a matter of fact, but maybe we could talk sometime. And I was talking to the fan community, and I'm like, am I the only one who has like real difficulty following some of these episodes? So I was like, yeah, it's it makes a lot more sense after you've listened to about 60 or 70 of them. And I'm like... Uh, oh, and each one's about an hour to an hour and a half long. So uh, now I know what it feels like when someone recommends to their friend that their friend listen to Mates the Podcast, because I, th I think we're about the same. <laughs> so <laughs> Probably. I'll, be I'll bet we're just 50 episodes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Un <laughs> under 50. We're one of the quick reads. All right. Well, today we are looking at Tradition Book Order of Hermes, and this was written for Revised Edition. It clocks in at 100 pages. It came out to us in 2003, and the contributing authors were Stephen Michael DePesa and Satiros Bracado, who was publishing at the time under the name uh, Phil Bracado. I think it's a good time to start a walkthrough. Terry, can you help me out? Sure. This starts with a piece of prologue fiction called Renegade, and it involves the thing I never thought I would hear in a mage game, and that is a hermetic action adventure. It is a character who appears to be getting ready to blow up a nuclear power plant to show the normies that their view of the world is precarious. And then another guy's like, yeah, I know the technocrats killed their your family you don't need to do this he's like and the other guy's like that's obviously not why i'm about to blow up all these innocent people it's like it it, it totally is steve you should stop doing this he goes la 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 can't hear you but in the process of going la 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 can't hear you he said la 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 incorrectly in anakian which means the other guy got to hit him with a spell no one dies and i'm gonna cheat normally i do a quote at the end but just to tell you what this shotgun blast of a fiction starts with it says i've seen a what a nuclear blast does to those at ground zero and what it does those caught in the fallout zone i am not proud of what i'm doing pembroke then stop doing it augustus replied easing off the safety of his weapon you know pembroke richard retorted never losing the hollow and heartless half smile i recall saying almost the, the very thing to the man in black right before he shot my baby girl in the face please stop it's all i could think to say it's the kind of thing a desperate man says when inevitability is about to steamroll him and shatter his world are you going to kill me? Augustus knocked him unconscious with a blow of the head from the butt of his pistol. That's for the Quasitori to decide. He took out his cellular phone from his jacket with his bleeding left hand and dialed a number from memory. Julian, it's done. I need a gateway. Um, and you're like, <laughs> this is a book. And that's, that's all on one page. And this may win for the ratio of me talking about it two pages of prologue before. But immediately after, we get into the introduction called Phoenix from the Flames. And it opens in Latin. So you know this is going to be an exciting one. And it goes over the theme, mood, and intent of the book. A lot of the books in Revised, at least on the tradition level, talk about how this is a new book about how the tradition is reforged. But boy howdy, does... Order of Hermes kind of doubled down on that, especially when they're like, just in case you don't believe us, go read Blood Treachery in case you need a reminder that they've been recently kicked in the teeth. So the, the opening thesis is that the Hermetics have not enjoyed the rising tide of sleepers being interested in magic that has helped other traditions, and they're trying to figure out what to do of that. The theme for the book is Rebirth Unto Perfection, and one of the recurring themes in the book is the 
idea in alchemy of putrefaction, that something needs to be broken down so that it can be rebuilt again. The mood listed is Defiant Euphoria, that the previous Arx Hermeticum or the Hermetic Fortress was protecting the old wizards. That has broken and that there are new people setting up shop. The new mages are proud and capable and want to show both their predecessors and their fellow mages what the Order of Hermes is capable of. The introduction chapter ends with a brief one-page lexicon. They use this kind of as an opportunity to drop in some bits of lore. One, they mentioned the Arx Hermeticum, which was once a reference symbolically to Duizatep, but now that it's fallen, it is referring to something new, the organization of the Order of Hermes that is trying to be rebuilt. This also gets the award for least effective new term minted, and that is referring to the internet as wing and it can be used both as a noun and a verb i've been riding the wing this morning and were you winging when i called earlier in the latter context wing sounds like a weird drug that hermetics are taking they also talk about the uh, circlus abstrusus the now fallen inner circle of hermetic archmasters that was cracked by Duizatep's ruin and wrecked during the concordia war i don't remember hearing this term before and they talk about the city of pymander no longer being something that most hermetics talk about and then in the rest of the book it talks about the city of Pymander a bunch. But hey, interestingly, we also largely drop the usage of the term twilight as an alternative for quiet. Adam, what did you think about the introduction? Uh, I liked the defiant tone it started out with. I, I thought that was really appropriate for mages who uh, try with strong will to batter down all resistance. That, that was kind of cool for me. Also, in the lexicon, although a lot of uh, ground was recovered and that unfortunate uh, wing reference was put in. Uh, I really liked their explanation of how you can use the word banny in a sentence, like, you know, from, from this house or from this uh, tradition in the Council of Nine. I thought that was pretty cool. I liked that. But uh, other than that, uh, I'm ready for chapter one. Chapter one is entitled Lightning and Serpents. And I would just like to say that this book departs in two ways that I very much enjoy. One, the chapters open with a section heading. In a lot of mage books, it just starts with text with a drop cap, and then eventually you will get some sort of heading. As someone who enjoys having reasonably thorough episode outlines, I very much appreciated that. The other thing it does is there is no frame narrative. We don't follow Harry Hermetic as in world we get dense discussions back and forth about the order of the nature of Hermes. So like at one end of the spectrum, you have the hollow one book where it took literally several thousand words to get any setting information that was uh, concrete. And here it's like, once there was a wizard, we're going to tell you what the olden days are like, and we're going to give you a brief metaphor before we just go into dense prose. And I'm like, yeah, order of Hermes. So the first part of that section is entitled the dancing mage, which is a fable of a dancing mage who gains great power and loses it when he stumbles. He writes himself and instead of choosing to dance again, begins to walk. And I'm like, ah, okay, I think that's a metaphor. And when I heard dancing mage, I could only think of it to the tune of dancing queen. So that's something I'd like to have exist. The hermetics must remember that Hermes was a trickster, a thief, and a messenger, and that eventually discipline, which was the call of Hermes to acquire wisdom, became dogma. Once a method that had worked had been created, it was presumed that all the trappings around that method were also vital. The next section is the body of Hermes, and it is a beginning of history. They talk about kind of their prehistory, where they talk about the first creator being the word that spoke itself. And we get this roughly Kabbalistic creation story of the two parts of God building creation from the emanations of a, a kind of tree of life, that there is a pattern to the elements of reality, and all forming from a word that, as I said, spoke itself. At the same time, terrible things were born out of the space absent from the will of whatever this creator was, and that species that predated humanity built great cities with dark knowledge, and eventually with time they ascended or were destroyed and were swept away. 
balance was ultimately restored and humanity could command those forces if they were willing to face the terrors in the area swept away. The races that existed before humanity had ascended, but we hadn't. And the question kind of is why and also what happened to them. I like this from the idea that uh, it presents the idea that if you want to take this literally, there could be ruins of, of great races or species that existed before humanity that are out there that your characters can go out and find. It then kind of suggests at some point the creator stepped away and asks, how did we survive without God's direct grace? And the three gifts that ensured humanity's survival were the imagination to create, the technology to refine, and the will to triumph over adversity. Hermetic arrogance comes from the plan of the fact that baked within the human body is kind of this plan of creation. And it talks about uh, Adam Kadmon, the primordial man, and how the various parts of the body map to different places. And this is something that, that occurs in, in a number of magical practices. And then we kind of enter the the known history portion. Uh, they trace back to Egypt that King Thosmes and Hatshepsut assembled the Vizier's Jahoudi and Sheshita from who were Phoenician. And they gathered wisdom of all forms, and they created the orders of the cup and the reed, which are generally traced to be the predecessors of the traditions in the technocracy. They planned out the spheres, they figured out sacred geometry, and these two groups ultimately disagreed, and discord was sown between the two of them. It slightly reverses previous book, and instead of being like, Solomon, he was great, we loved him, he was obviously one of our members, they're just like, Solomon was great. He wasn't one of our members because we didn't exist yet, and that would be stupid to claim otherwise. I'm like, good job, new authors. It talks about the development of Greek mystery cults, that they were accumulating wisdom as well, and there was a gulf between the various practices that were occurring in ancient Greece. The acousmatics fueled the rise of the Dedalians, so the followers of Pythagoras, and that there was kind of an early mage war in Alexandria, which in the first century BCE, there were about 20 mages there for something like 350,000 people. There's an aside on the nature of Hermes, and they emphasize that there are multiple natures to the character. He, he was a mystic, he was a god, he was an archetype. Uh, carries the caduceus, which is still held as a symbol for ascension. And we also get an aside on Sophia, the wisdom's queen, kind of you could say the feminine aspect to the, the masculine Hermes. And it walks through some of the examples and emanations of that. With time, after the fall of Alexandria, Hermes gets reinterpreted, that the Romans reinterpreted Hermes the trickster, and we got Mercury the wise, who sweeps away ignorance. In early Rome, you have cults of Hermes, of Isis, of Mithras, and of Jesus, all side by side for a period of time until things spill over in what they refer to as the first burning. When the wizard war kind of erupts, there's a war on the frontier of the Roman Empire with the pre-British, and mages spend their magic to bring plagues and fires, and that, that didn't really work out well. After the fall of Rome, the Hermetics band together to save wisdom and to fight off vampires and werewolves. The Batini are formed, and uh, a number of mages move to the warmer climes around where Islam is getting started. Merlin is claimed as a proto-Hermetic who wanted to build civilization. In dark corners, Creamon and Bonnie Sages are refining magic in an area outside of where civilization has collapsed. It is quite simply easier to do magic. Much of the lore that had been developed over the Roman Empire was forgotten. By 700, mages were thieving to find magic and covenants had formed to protect each other. By 767, the Pax Hermeticum formed of 12 masters brought together by Bonnie Sages and they gained control of Duizatep from the Nefandi, moved it from Turkey to the Pyrenees, some chantries were helping the locals and others didn't. During this time, one of the founding masters, Tremere, a master of Kurdiman and interpersonal dealings and so on, kind of engineered something called the Schism War. There was a group of mages under House Diadne, which were secretive and violated the Hermetic Order to share your magic, who insulted Tremere, who set the order against Diadne and ultimately consolidated power after declaring them to be all infernalists. Tremere becomes a vampire, the Masasa War begins, and at the end of it, sometime in the 11th or 12th century, there are fewer than 100 Hermetics left at the end. The mages are generally more powerful, but the vampires have the ability to multiply much more quickly. The fall of Mistridge comes in 1210, thanks craftsmasons, and we get a new rising magical paradigm in the 1400 called 
Ars Cupididae, which is a mix of psychology, exercise, swordsmanship, beekeeping, and like a few other things. Considered necessary, not even if being actively used in magic. The Hermetics realize that they're kind of losing public mind share, and Latal forms a set of universities in the 1300s to revise academics is killed seemingly in a club fight, like literally with clubs. And I'm like, okay, that's a choice. We get a list of interesting events from the Sorcerer's Crusade, including events like the Siege of Duizatap, which we had heard about before, the Battle of Flames, where Hermetics and Pagan Kin rouse dragons to defeat clockwork monstrosities, Wingard's March uh, led armies against uh, across Britain to to kill the night folk and so on. We get the Clockwork Purge, the Lodge Wars of Tuscany, and I'm like, yep, this is the mage I like, where it's a short bulleted list of interesting things that are going to happen. It mentions that in this period of time that they were able to meet the Dedalians toe for toe, but were afraid of pushing for fear of there becoming another Dark Ages, for them pushing and causing an accidental fall of Rome, and that they stuck to their towers, which becomes a recurring theme throughout the book. There are new houses, but with the rise of the order of reason, dominion becomes the consensus. Instead of it being the things that a mage can possibly do, it is a subset of all possible things that a mage can actually accomplish. It is functionally the same, but instead of saying, we are mages, we are expanding the realm of possibility, it's saying, okay, the consensus is limiting us, what can we actually get away with? It goes through kind of a second burning time that occurs during the Renaissance. It mentions, again, a, a few more houses that join, and it, it mentions that after a couple of centuries, they were clearly established as three main characters within the order of Hermes that wielded the most power. You had Porthos, who says that the young are the future and is trying to balance out his madness, more or less. It talks about Porthos Fitzempris. It talks about Master Sao Cristoval, who is the primus and is a bit of an asshole. And it does mention that it's like people overemphasize the asshole portion <laughs> of his legacy. And I'm like, okay, that's good to know. And then finally, we have Chiron Mustai, who is using new mages as pawns to enact a kind of political war. And that kind of sets up the background for what's going to happen in the 21st century. We get the arrival of False Hillel, turns Christoval to gold, sets Duizatep on fire, Mustai dies in the conflagration, Porthos dies trying to contain the explosion to prevent the destruction of Duizatep from destroying realms all over the place. Eventually, False Hillel is revealed by Acrides Solonikus, which suggests that Acrides is back. Creamon as a house kind of went crazy when Zapathosora arose as the Ravnos anti-Diluvian in Bangladesh. Quasitor as a house ignores the purges of the Janissaries that occur after Mustai dies and the revelation that they're descendants of the Caserify. Uh, and we also get a list of new houses. And it's kind of a bang up wrap up to the chapter. It gives a snapshot of who is there at the founding and a bunch of, of newer houses. Yeah, there was, uh, I guess, a lot going on in Chapter 1. First off, the Who is Hermes sidebar that you referred to earlier. I, I thought that was very useful, not so much for players, but for storytellers who want to play with different ideas and themes going through hermetic thought. If they have a scene or plot line running through the game where they focus on the Order of Hermes, that, that can be very helpful for a storyteller. So that was nice. Um, honestly, I thought there was way too much religion in this chapter. I mean, it was constantly talking about religion outright and religious themes and how everything ties back to religion. And I I don't think that really fits, uh, not only for the Order of Hermes, but especially for the 21st century Order of Hermes. It just sounded kind of uh, off to me. The history for the public order of Hermes, uh, that is, you know, in the Middle Ages, uh, that, that was useful. I mean, we've had that material before, so there was a lot of repeat, but the level of detail is nice and can make it something I might think about referring back to as a storyteller if I want to play with different historical ideas popping up in the modern day. Page 35 has a sidebar, Newer Houses. This was really great. I, I like this a lot. Not only does it give a very brief rundown on the original houses in, in the year 767, but also the new ones that were added when they were added. It also has dead houses, which is houses that were new. They ran for a number of years, and then they they were canceled. They they died out. They they quit, and it gives dates for those in a really handy format. It's like one page that I would uh, turn to again and again as a storyteller if I'm playing with the past of the Order of Hermes. 
I got to say, overall, for chapter one, the tone of the writing was a downer for me. I was constantly feeling depressed. It seems like it wanted to zero in on futility and failures from the beginning of the historical account right through to the end. So that uh, for a, a defiant, uh, hopeful order that is rebuilding itself, that seemed like just the wrong tone for the chapter. One thing that stood out to me was towards the end of the historical account, it talked about how somewhere around the, the mid-1600s, somewhere around 1650, the Order of Hermes got into a, a big conflict and uh, they lost a lot from it, but they made a uh, realization. And that was that the dominion had passed, the consensus had began, and Unlike you, when I was reading this chapter, the impression I got from Dominion was I was remembering uh, hearing that word specifically in the past in Ars Magica books and in the first two editions of Mage. And I thought Dominion meant the overpowering notion among sleepers that in, in Europe in the Middle Ages that the Christian faith was, was basically true and that the influence of uh, the church and its adherents was having a big effect on magic and how things things worked, and the Order of Hermes had to take that into account. But in the mid-1600s, the Order of Hermes came to realize that, no, that the dominion is, is over. That time is done and is no longer a dominant influence on the beliefs of sleepers and on society. Now it is the consensus, which is a more, I guess you could say, materialistic, modern, scientific mode of thought, and could see that that was uh, taking control over the minds of sleepers and uh, the way society worked. And so the Order of Hermes had to adjust around that. So th that was very interesting for me. Um, one other point on chapter one was it seems to repeat the revised edition notion that horizon realms of the past, of course they, they're not around anymore, were nothing but bad. They were a 100% mistake. And uh, it just seems like the Order of Hermes, with all of their resources and all of their personnel and activity over the course of hundreds of years, seems like that group, if any, would realize the usefulness of Horizon Realms before the world changed and they all went away. So it, it seems kind of odd to me for all these hermetics to get together and say, yeah, Horizon Realms, what were we thinking? Nothing but stupid, even back when they worked. So that, that was a little odd for me. But Chapter 2 is entitled The Will and the Word. And it starts with rank and privilege. And just like in the first edition book, we get a review of the various ranks. It mentions that the Order of Hermes is easily the most hierarchical. And it also mentions that the Order of Hermes is somewhat unique in that it is able to regularly induce people to awaken. And this is something I spent a fair amount of time just kind of thinking about because they mention that once you reach the fifth degree, which only requires the ability to get a second dot at initiate exemptus, you will start taking on apprentices. And if you're taking apprentices on two dots and you can reliably induce awakenings, this like leads to kind of a, a head count problem. So my interpretation of that is you can get apprentices. You may not, there just may not be enough. Also that the rate of burnout may be exceptionally high. We never really get some, any information about that. It makes an aside that says people who don't ultimately awaken still have a role within the order, but that they are ultimately, and the word they use is children. And I'm like, wow, okay. And they make mention to, to great failures like Nicodemus Mulhouse, who has merely been able to survive for, what, like nine centuries or something like that, brewing their own potions of immortality and such. But that when they are trying to recruit, they are looking for people who are, are, are hungry and, and curious. That until recently, that largely fell on House Fortunae, who used their knowledge of probability and numismancy to find people and that then they used chains of communication to kind of pass it around, but that that has very much broadened, that the the curious and interested are ultimately find their way in. You start as an apprentice, that you move on to becoming a neophyte, you may move to one of the former three college covenants, that you have to learn a lot of languages, that the mentor-student relationship is established, and this is kind of listed as a, a long and boring portion that is also quite hard. You become a zealotor after that, where you need to transcend the power uh, that you learned during your apprenticeship. 
that you go from this very basic uh, charm-based magic to something that is closer to higher magic. You move from Goetia to uh, Thurgia that you start being courted by other members who ultimately may want you to work for them and you start getting your first missions. At the level above that, at Practicus, you will choose a word, which is a single word that is going to be rife with symbolism and mystic weight that you will embody, setting down the, the path as you metamorphose into something divine. This is the point at which you kind of need to awaken or you get stuck here. Uh, beyond this, you have Initiate, where you uh, need to have a dot in Ars Virium plus a specialty sphere at minimum, and that you can act as a member of a tribunal, at least. You can start taking uh, participation in the uh, legal practices of the Order of Hermes. Above that, we have Initiate Exemptus, where you get your second dot, you get Apprentices, and then you have another rank of Adept at your third, Adept Major at fourth uh, magister when you have mastery and magister mundi when you become more or less a force of nature it suggests that there may be a 10th degree that is unrecognized at which point you are an oracle and that there are only nine oracles at any given time that when a 10th oracle ascends it is brought back to one and what that means is uncertain the question of how many oracles are there is an interesting question to me and Mage in that it is something that, that varies wildly across editions, uh, whether there's an arbitrary number of them or there there is some fixed one. We never really get too much information about them. And the next section focuses on politics, and this is kind of surprisingly short to me. It talks about mias, which is the Arabic word for quicksand, and that generally you're trading favor between each other in the form of sa a kind of divine liquid in Egyptian cosmology. And it is the heart's blood that keeps things moving, that new members will be very quickly drawn into a network of boons and favors and debts and so on to kind of keep the organization going. Some people get completely wrapped up in this political machinations where others are able to use it to acquire the resources they need and study materials and kind of the best apprenticeships and so on. We get the Code of Hermes, which is just a list of things that you are or aren't going to do, and this kind of lists what they are as well as the reality. And it's perfectly reasonable that they go over certain things where it's like, I shall not through action or inaction endanger the order, nor consort with devils or the undead, nor anger the fae. And it's like, yeah, this one was a real practical one after the Masasa War. Also House Marionita, thanks. <laughs> we don't even know if the Fae still exists, but I guess be nice to them if you find them. It goes through what the hermetic justice process is, the difference between high crimes and low crimes. And a lot of this very much follows what we've gotten previously on how the tradition works, except for this is in a little bit more detail. We also get some information on what the act of Gilgul is like. We don't get dots or anything, but it makes mention that since the the destruction of Halel's avatar after the fall of the first cabal, the order has only con conducted perhaps 15 Gilgul rites. It also mentions in other books that a fair number of these were actually done in the wake of World War II, which suggests that maybe one happens every 50 to 100 years. So you may not have a lot of people running around that know how to do this. It is overseen by six Quasitori. It mentions that the other five are kind of there to provide assurance, but also emotional support because this is hard. And I appreciated that because you're like, yeah, it's, I can see that can be really hard for mates to do. So like you want to bring some friends. And with that, it goes on to the houses of Hermes. And when I think houses, I think factions. And when I think factions, I think Adam. Adam, can you walk us through the houses of the Order of Hermes? Certainly, not that I'm a particularly factional sort of person. I'm not trying to divide no. up uh, any, anything. Not a but, strong sectarian. But, not a strong sectarian, but I do like talking about groups of people. So, the Houses of Hermes started in the year 767 and have been changing for centuries. The major houses have full voting and representation at order meetings. Minor houses exist inside House Ex Miscellanea, which is recognized as a major house. The houses we've presented to you in the past will get shorter descriptions today. I'll focus on changes that have occurred since the first Order of Hermes tradition book. When we look at major houses, we have Bonus Agus. Mages foc these mages focus on research and magical theories. After the fall of Doisetep, there have been very few members. They currently have no leader. House Ex Miscellanea. Started as a house for mages that didn't fit in the other houses, all of the minor houses exist inside here. It used to be known as a place for old houses to die, but now it has become a breeding ground for new houses and new ideas. House Flambeau. 
Uh, these mages specialize in forces magic and have long been known as protectors of the order and enforcers of its will. House Fortune. Uh, this started in 1910 and was promoted to a major house in 1936. They focus on numerology, mathematics, and seeing the future. They are active in Sleeper Society, where they handle finances and recruiting for the order, although recruiting is harder after the reckoning. House Quasitor members still serve as judges and lawgivers for the order. This house has always garnered respect for the responsibilities it bears. House Shea joined the order as a minor house in 1412. They existed as a group before they joined the Order of Hermes in 1412, but uh, they became a minor house then. They became a major house in 1982. These mages are mostly women who are priestesses of ancient Egyptian traditions. They are expert historians and linguists. House Salificati started as a tradition in the Council of Nine, uh, but became a craft after the disaster of the First Cabal. In 2000, they joined the order as a major house. Masters of alchemy, their young members, sometimes called children of knowledge, are experimenting with consciousness-expanding substances to spread awakening to the masses. House Titleist mages believe strength comes from overcoming challenges. These mages constantly test themselves and have become strategists and generals for the order. After the second conflict with the Tremere vampires, this house is trying to recover. House Verdidius were the crafters of countless wonders for hundreds of years. During the Industrial Revolution, they fell out of favor and retreated into House Ex Miscellanea. They recently returned to major house status. They now create techno-magical wonders that are gaining notice. Several members of former House Thig now reside here. Now let's take a look at the minor houses. We have Kriaman. For hundreds of years, these mages have tattooed themselves and pondered riddles. In the 1700s, their dwindling numbers and influence pushed them into House Ex Miscellanea. The few remaining today went into quiet when the Avatar storm started. Uh, they have just recovered and claim to have gained mystic insight. Uh, House Honglei, first mentioned in Dragons of the East, this group in Hong Kong mixed Eastern and Western occult practices. This book presents them as Wulung mages who now reside within the order and carry on the practices of the Wulung there. House Yarbatan retreated to House Ex Miscellanea around 1300. These were the mages who mixed more with sleepers and prided themselves on being less mystic and more urbane. They now pursue the arts, psychology, and education to bring hermetic ideals to sleepers. House Marinida mages always sought greater connection with the Fey folk. They lost influence in the 1300s and joined House Ex Miscellanea. They now struggle to recruit new members and may not last long. House Noma, uh, although present at the Grand Convocation of the Council of Nine, this group of African mages who pursue high ritual magic went their own way. They just recently joined the order and great things are expected of them. Uh, House Scopos started in 2000, the year 2000, and only has three members. They apply hermetic principles to noetics and quantum physics. Many hermetics wonder if they have a future. House Zeos, uh, starts with a capital letter X, I'm going to guess on the pronunciation, began in 2001. Some members of the dissolving House Thig gathered under the leadership of a mysterious woman calling herself Callisti. They practice chaos magic with odd and seemingly contradictory practices that some call sloppy. This is a good place to give my own comments on the changes to the Houses of Hermes in this book. Although I think Yarbatan should have disappeared long ago, I'm in favor of most of the changes we see here. Janissary and Thig are now gone. Uh, House Janissary always seemed like a good villain group to use in stories, but I couldn't see them lasting long. They made too many enemies and tried to wrestle House Quasitor's authority away. House Thig also looked unstable. Not only were they wild and irresponsible, but they relied too much on House Janissary. Bringing back House uh, Verdidius fits well with Revised Edition's emphasis on more groups turning to Technomagic. It makes sense that the Order would revive an internal group that is ready to embrace Technomagic. Scopos and Zeos both look interesting to me. Young and small, they don't attract much attention, but player characters could pursue modern takes on mystic magical theories there. My only concern is Zeos is made to look like it will collapse soon. It has a terrible reputation, its practices are contradictory, and its leader seems to be hung up on a former young member of House Thig that she has a crush on. I understand reputations aren't always accurate and players could find drama in struggling against them, but to say the group's leader is obsessed with a personal relationship does not bode well for Zeos's future. Uh, Terry, what did you think on the house changes? So I pronounce X-A-O-S as chaos, because I think the X is supposed to be a Kai. That's just my guess. But I, I could go with that. Yeah. As we established in the previous episode, there are no houses that you and I pronounce the same, except for S X Miscellanea. 
And I like the fact that that is the one where we're like, nope, that's how it's done. And I, I look forward to finding out that we're both doing that, doing that wrong. I, I like the fact that it gives us a bunch of houses in various states. The Kalisti is interesting because it does have that obvious sense of this isn't going to last. But what interesting thing will happen as it shatters? I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of those weird things that came up because it was like part of somebody's house game or something like that. I like the fact that they backfilled like house... Bjornair and House Diadne. We never really got a lot of information about those previously. We got a little more information on Tremere. That was in the previous par uh, chapter when it gives us the, the 12 founding houses. We get a bunch of things that we can play with. And it's kind of neat because not until you see all the houses next to each other do you realize how big the Order of Hermes is in terms of variety of expressions of magical practice. Like to me, the Hermetics and maybe the Society of Ether are the two that have a very short description of what they look like, like high ritual magic and weird science. But when you see all of the emanations and all the versions of that, boy, howdy, is it big. And I, I appreciate that because I like traditions that are uh, big and broad and diverse and have mostly a, a political unity at its core. The, the houses seem to be broken into those who were brought together by an interesting topic and those that were kind of brought together by an interesting person. Like there are certain houses that very much bear the stamp of their creator on them. I also wouldn't have a problem if in M20 we got five or six new houses and a few others that had dropped out of favor. So the rest of the chapter goes over paradigm and belief and magic. And it says the cornerstone of the hermetic paradigm is the ascendancy of the will. They explore the darkness that was created, that was left after the absence of the creator. And in exploring the both the dark and the light, they can command all of creation. They were the first to label the nine spheres. We get new titles for the spheres in this book. Uh, forces goes from Ars Essentia to Ars Virium. Okay, sure. It goes over the spheres and the common foci, which I uh, appreciate. This is obviously going to vary by the type of hermetic, but it gives you some good places to start. It mentions that the Order of Hermes does believe in a 10th sphere, that it is Ars Unitatis, the art of unity, and that as a kind of an aside, they're like, oh, it's interesting that the Hermetics, the Batini, and the Salificati all believe in the same kind of 10th sphere. Huh, how about that? As that eventually comes back. We get a unique view of how the Hermetics view resonance, that they say it is the mantle that separates mages from simple mortals, that Hermetic paradigm teaches an embrace of resonance as a mark of distinction, a shield against the sleeping world, and even a calling card. A great wizard's work should be known and branded with his seal. And I'm like, nice. In the previous books, they were like, quiet, it happens to people. Maybe you should spend some time there, learn something a little bit about themselves. And now it's like, what's resonance? I'll tell you what resonance is. It's the best thing you've ever had. It's a cold beer on a hot day. It's the it's the embrace of your favorite pet. And you're like, okay, that's a, that's a way to take it. It also talks to the point of, so a lot of the things that we explain are very time consuming to do. Like when it talks about a road that requires you uh, collecting the, uh, the tears of weasels over like a full moon or something like that. And you're like, where are people actually doing that? And it's like, well, the Akashic brother is probably spending a couple hours hours a day just exercising <laughs> and you're like oh, okay that that makes sense kind of on the grand scheme of things i think that is more a commentary on how i wish other paradigms focused on the sheer amount of prep work they likely involve but i'm glad that it is discussed here we get two new abilities uh Enochian and umbral protocol and i'm going to institute robinson's rule if you're going to add an ability to the game and you don't immediately give me three examples of why you would use that instead of something else like with an example you're just making the game more complicated umbrood protocol is mentioned later as a way of getting umbrood to follow umbrood protocol but the anakian thing it kind of mentions that it could be used to assist magical roles which if that's something you allow can become very powerful if you're allowing an arbitrary ability enhances a retay role 
there's that. We also get the ability specialties for a cult. Uh, and then we get a few rotes. And the rotes are, I think, flavorful and interesting. Betrayal of the Burning Arrow, which is basically counter magic against the 10th sphere. That is the sphere of gun. Easily one of the deadliest <laughs> spheres in the world of darkness. If you're in our Mage the Podcast Discord, uh, discord.me slash Mage the Podcast, uh, one of the participants created a sphere symbol for the sphere of gun. And I am very pleased anytime I get to use that. We also get the Occlude the Seal of Power, which gives you the ability to hide and maneuver resonance. You also get Vulcan's Hammer, which has an amazing opening line of, there are times when subtlety is called for. Vulcan's Hammer is not a rote for those times. We get a few wonders. One is the Assassin's Blade, which lets you stab a guy at a distance. And they're like, yeah, a whole bunch of these showed up when Janissary disappeared. I'm like, that reads. I really like in the setting where they say, hey, here's a wonder. Here's where we found it. And I think that is interesting and flavorful and gives a, a, a background idea. It, one of the rotes is called Caesar's Due, and you kind of make this summoning circle for money out of bank cards. And I just thought that that was a very good example of what contemporary hermetic practice could kind of look like. They talk about the naming of a hermetic, which it talks about the various labels of you have a shadow name, that you have a practical name, that you have a craft name, that there are various parts of it, that you develop a, cr a true name, that if someone else knows it, they are considered to be much closer for the purpose of correspondence magic. If they don't know it, they are considered to be much further. They, uh, importantly to me, the requirements to discern someone else's true name goes from mind three to mind four, which I appreciate. I thought mind three was a, a little too easy for it to do. We get information about pacting, how to bind a umbrood. The system here was a little bit messy for me in that it involves each character making a social attribute plus ability role against kind of the other person's willpower, where I would have just probably done it as direct attribute plus ability against Gnosis or something like that. The idea of it both sides doing a resisted role seems overly complicated. Uh, it gives some information on generally what, what what is done, the way there's a period of fasting and cleansing that usually happens, the importance of making sure that the stage is appropriately prepared, the difference between what you can do with uh, Spirit 2 versus Spirit 4, what happens if anyone botches, what the general terms are, and that this is a matter of pageantry, that this should be sheer role playing as everyone tries to muster as much power as they can to convince the other party that they're really the one in charge before they get down to brass tacks and kind of make an agreement. And with that, that draws the end of chapter two. It had a bunch of useful systems. It had the houses in all of their glory. It went over the paradigm, I think, in a good level of detail. Adam, what did you think about it? Chapter two is my favorite chapter of the book. I think it had a lot of useful material and not a lot of useless clutter. One thing was on, on page 38, they talk about how recruitment, um, I have a quote here, a quote, scholarly circle or sleeper occult fellowship, since the order has eyes and influence in virtually all of the marginally reputable ones, end quote. It's talking about how the order of Hermes, um, they recruit new members by keeping a close watch on a lot of different occult groups among sleepers. It sounds reasonable. It, it sounds like what they were doing in previous editions, but how does the Order of Hermes have the manpower to do this after the reckoning? I like again, I like the idea, but in the setting of revised edition with with all that's going on, it seems like it would be very difficult to keep that up. There was a sidebar on Goetia, Theurgia, Magia, the three different uh, levels of magic. Each each one is better than the one before. I like that, but. Again, it contradicts the revised edition idea that mages and sorcerers can't tell each other apart. And again, I think also on the same page, page 39, there's a mention of how sorcerers do not progress beyond the zealotor rank. And this, this makes sense to me, but by now, I think after, now that we're at the end of revised edition, I think it is a... I am ready to officially pass judgment on this idea that sorcerers and mages can't tell each other apart. And... All through revised edition under two different developers, I saw many, many examples in the books where they could tell each other apart, often followed by like one sentence in the text saying, by the way, they can't tell each other apart. I think it's time to let this notion go. I think they can tell each other apart. I've had so many examples in, in um, all three of the first editions of Mage. But again, that is my views. Uh, those of you listening, you are, are free to disagree. Um, I certainly don't know everything, and you can let us know on Discord or by email. There was a section here that I did not see in previous write-ups of the Order of Hermes, and that was about family and how many hermetics don't have families, and that's why they use a lot of uh, family kinds of terms 
for um, relationships that they develop inside the Order of Hermes. I thought this was uh, eye-opening. I, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, certainly very reasonable. I think it adds possibilities for emotional storytelling. It, it made sense to me. Yeah, put a gold star next to this section. I would like to have seen it in previous write-ups. Uh, there's a section on the politics of power. Not to get into this, but as I've said before, I think sphere knowledge in the Order of Hermes would count higher than political maneuvering and political pull. Uh, I think before they, they let you address the group or, you know, share your opinion, they're going to ask, well, you know, how much study have you done? How much uh, of our knowledge have you uh, soaked in and, and been able to demonstrate before we're going to really recognize you as a big wheel? The Code of Hermes is given again, and we have this from previous editions. This time, I think there's, there's so much talk of pre-reckoning times in the Code of Hermes that it can be confusing for people reading this book. Um, as I was reading through this Code of Hermes, I, I kept thinking, wait a minute, are we talking about before the Reckoning or after the Reckoning? Because this game is based in after the Reckoning now. Why are we hearing so much about before the Reckoning? It's kind of confusing me. Page 47, there was a section, What's in a Name? And this was interesting for me because at the end of that section, it gave a little support for the idea that Gilgul may not necessarily destroy the Avatar, but merely separate it from the mage. And I've had discussions with other mage fans where I say, hey, look, maybe the Avatar is just being separated, not destroyed. And they say, no, 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 the books say that it is destroyed. And yes, the books do say that the Avatar is destroyed. However, they never say how mages know this. It, it just says it and moves on, regardless of what edition of mage we're talking about. And so my point is, uh, how do mages necessarily know this? It could be that they're just separating, you know, forever separating the avatar from a particular mage. And so that mage certainly suffers, but the avatar goes on and continues connecting with other mages in the future. Uh, I, I don't see how there is evidence to support cutting out that idea entirely. And from my point of view, how are mages going to feel about destroying an avatar? That's, that's basically making it so that there's less magic and less mages in the world in the future. That would, seems like that would be something that mages would really want to think twice about, seeing as how there are so few mages. But uh, again, that, that's my personal conjecture. When they talked about the houses of Hermes, those text areas, uh, they had a, a semi-transparent image of the uh, heraldry shield of that house behind the text. It made it hard to read. I mean, I, I guess it looked kind of cool, but when it makes the text hard to read, it's time to rethink that. Uh, one of the things about uh, Revised Edition that stands out to me as a Mage fan is there were a lot of desktop publishing possibilities that opened up with the technology in the early 2000s. And so they tried a lot of stuff and some of it just didn't make it in the end. And so, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to have some failures with all that experimenting. The handwritten notes of Dead Magic 1. Ooh, those are rough. <laughs> yeah. If you are focusing on the Order of Hermes, if you have an all Order of Hermes uh, group of players, or if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one with a Hermetic player character, uh, I think these two abilities can be fun. When you have a, a mixed group, there's just one or two Hermetics with a bunch of other different kind of mages, I would tend not to use these abilities or to uh, de-emphasize them. Uh, when it came to rotes, there were a lot of clever rotes here. I'm, I'm finding better rotes in this book than I've seen in the, in the last couple of books. I really like to occlude the Seal of Power, which, which Terry mentioned. Uh, how you can play with your resonance and even disguise it and make it look like uh, someone else's resonance and um, uh, other alterations. That was really cool. Uh, when it came to wonders, um, I really liked the Assassin's Blade. I thought that was neat. Uh, some people would say it's too combat-oriented or too powerful. I, I like getting into the higher sphere levels and seeing what kind of cool magic can happen. This, this is basically a dagger that lets you stab someone at a distance, and then after the deed is done, the wound disappears, or it's harder to see that the person was stabbed. The doctors look and say, hey, heart attack, I guess. He just died. What can I say? So, yeah, when you have sphere magic, mages can do some, uh, you know, pretty, pretty uh, dark and dirty deeds and cover it up pretty well. So I, I like it when uh, there are wonders that remind us of that. And at the end, we get the, uh, the rules for the pacting system, making pacts with Umbrood, how to uh, negotiate with them or, or wrestle with them magically to make them uh, see things from your point of view. It was a lot of detailed rules, 
And I think it can be fun if the player wants to do a long dramatic scene where this is played out. I think if you've got one or more players that, that are excited by this possibility, then I think these rules are fine. But if you're not really, really focusing in on this and you don't want a long drawn out dramatic scene with, with the Umbrood, then these rules are going to slow down your game and uh, might make other players, you know, non-hermetic players at the table uh, get bored. So... Think twice before pulling these into your game, but there are some possibilities there. I'm not ready to just write them off. The third chapter is entitled The Way of Pymander. It talks about some key people. We get the reintroduction of Primus Ishak Ibn Thoth of House Shi, who uh, we first met, I think, in Blood Treachery, when he's like, I'm in charge and you have to do what I say, but I'm really new at this, so I'll just go with what everyone else wants. Look at me, I'm a hermetic. And you're like, mm, you're kind of funded in there, buddy. <laughs> and when the guy from like House Titleist, like when uh, Lord Gilmore is like, maybe you should think about that again. He's like, nope, I've made my decision. It's like, ah, oh, buddy, you're not making this easy. And he's like three centuries old. Like I could see sometimes when like the kids are thrust into it, but he's like, oh, I'm new at this. Like you've had several centuries to prepare. It's, <laughs> um, which is interesting because this is the first, I think, Archmaster that we get in Revise. The first person that has like, hey, look on the sheet, there's a sixth dot, which I, I certainly appreciate because I love Archmasters. We get information about uh, Callisti High Priestess of the New House Chaos and uh, what what their deal is. They're made out to be the sexy mage that also is is clever and intelligent and breaks all the rules. And I'm like, it really feels like the hermetic version of Manic Pixie Dream Girl, but eh. And then we get information about Mark Hallward Gillen, who was the knight errant who departed from the Order of Hermes from House Flambeau rather explosively after uncovering kind of the hermetic complicitness in the House of Helicar incident involving the consanguinity of eternal joy. And it is impressive to me that this book doesn't really mention that event at all. That seemed to be like, <laughs> of the things that they miss where they're like, in 1347, this guy invented a new type of canopy and he became leader of his own house. And then they're like, oh yeah, this thing that brought down the Order of Hermes and ultimately resulted in the death of all the Janissaries. Let's just skip skip over that. I, I thought that could have brought a little bit of information, but the examples that they give, along with Malachi ben uh, Yeshua, are interesting characters that you can use. It talks about the Order of Hermes only chronicle and it's like yep there are a lot of houses have fun with that and that they the order of hermes is disproportionately likely to have single tradition chantries which is good to know it, it talks about kind of what the relationship between the houses are and then it introduces the the charles xavier school for gifted i mean the straussian uh the straussian academy which is one of the three academic chantries that exists within the order of hermes we get a bunch of characters we get their code for the Academy, and this is something that is perfectly usable. One of the ones I find interesting is the character of Victor Navarro, whose pater, uh, their mentor, went down in ignominy during the internal purges after the Second Masasa War for their product of prodigious consumption of vampiric blood and the betrayal of top-level hermetic intelligence to the descendants of the rogue Tremere. And he is resentful of the infinite potential that the kids there have. And I thought this was an interesting and compelling character. I thought most of the other ones were uh, good as well. The section ends with the mythoi in terms of new play content, which is the myths that the group has. We have the city of Pymander. Does it need to exist all at once? Can some of it embody in some places at some times? Do the oracles already dwell there? We get the prophecy of the final sun, which is tied to the Mayan calendar ending purportedly on December 23rd, 2012, or more accurately, the days flipping over in the long count calendar. The covenant at Budapest, which is a covenant that was in Hungary that was taken back over from the Tremere, and they're like, it's full of stuff. Have fun, kids. We get some character templates, and normally I don't like the character templates because they're not particularly interesting in a lot of cases, but here I think there are some pretty interesting options where they are all interesting variants to me on what the uh, hermetic theme is. Uh, more importantly, the people who wrote it up did not skimp on 
picking backgrounds that make sense. A lot of these characters have three dots and resources, which I think is perfectly reasonable if you want a character to be able to interact in the world and not really have to have a full-time job. We get some author's notes indicating the information that they had gotten. But, and that brings us to the end of chapter three. Adam, what did you think about chapter three? Uh, well, it uh, says in the beginning that the Order of Hermes is well suited to a one tradition chronicle, and I totally agree. There is so much history, so much variety in the Order of Hermes that, uh, yeah, a one tradition chronicle would, would probably sing regardless who is running that. The Strassen Academy is the example cabal here, as we see in uh, revised edition tradition books. Although not exciting, I guess, because it's, it's just a, a school for children, um, all of whom are sleepers and most or all of whom will never awaken. Although it, I wouldn't call it exciting, I did like it. I, I really, really like the motives behind the Strassen Academy. It made sense that the Order of Hermes would want to run educational institutions like this. Uh, not only do they have motivations that make sense to me, but just the, the nature of the Order of Hermes, um, all of their focus on scholarship and uh, their traditional influence in places of learning in Europe hundreds of years ago, it just makes, uh, it clicks for me that they would want to run schools and that they would uh, send some of their mages to personally uh, take part in that. Also, they give the Academy's code, which is like a microcosm of the Code of Hermes. It's like Code of Hermes for sleepers. I thought that was so cool. I I enjoyed reading through that. It's like, oh, I, I love that. Good move. Now, when it comes to the mythoi section, this is basically legends of old that may just still talk about today, and maybe you could uh, find some plot hooks in there. Out of three listings, there was only one real legend of old, and so I gotta say, I felt like the the cute little orphan in David Copperfield who's holding up the soup bowl and says, please, sir, can I have some more? Yeah, that was me after reading the mythoi section. Love the fact that the section was there, but can we please have some more old legends in our old legends section? Uh, although uh, there were some interesting plot hooks there. And uh, as for the templates, uh, yeah, like Terry, oftentimes when I read through the template sections at the end of tradition books of, of both, you know, of all of the first three editions, oftentimes they're not quite as exciting. This time they read more like talented sleepers than mages. Hmm. So I, I guess that fits for revised edition. I shouldn't complain, but it just wasn't exciting for me. Um, I'm glad that, that Terry was able to, to see something valuable there. And uh, that those are my thoughts on chapter three. Uh, sounds like we should roll into that epilogue. The final section is called the epilogue. And not all of the books have an epilogue as a discrete section. And this is entitled Dance with the Devil and involves a character encountering a uh, magister, so uh, a master who is reading something that is banned by the... Uh, by their reading list, the terrified student is given the choice of choose, Ethan, slavery or exaltation. Will you be a pawn in this game or a hand that controls the board? Choose. I will be here when you find the answer. And you're like, okay, that's a choice. And then finally, we get author's notes. There were recommendations. I have no way of evaluating them. I have read none of these books. It tips the hat to Ars Magica, which Mage has formally separated from at this point. Ars Magica is no longer considered canon to Mage history, which I appreciate. Uh, I may do a dive into Ars Magica as a supplemental episode at some point, and we get our our, our references. Uh, So Adam, what did you think about the epilogue? Uh, the epilogue was really thought-provoking for me. Um, it, it really made concrete the notion mentioned at the beginning of this book, and that is that hermetic, I guess, ideology teaches that the mage should have a strong will, that they should uh, overcome obstacles, bow to no one, and ultimately become the greatest power that they could possibly be. And so uh, here we have a mentor saying to his apprentice, um, yeah, I know these are banned uh, demonology books, but I'm going to read them because uh, I don't think all of these traditional notions of demon, especially, you know, coming from real world religions, I don't think they're accurate. Uh, I don't fear demons. And so I'm just going to learn all about them so that I can, you know, fight them or or bend them to my will. And uh, that's what uh, the Order of Hermes is really about. And you should be on board with that. And if not, then you can find another mentor. And so the, the, st- the apprentice basically walks out at the end and he's got a decision to make the epilogue doesn't cover that this this was very interesting to me i i would like to see how storytellers wrestle with this in their own games and that is basically the notion of does a strong will conquer all or are there some things out there in the universe that you shouldn't mess with 
Uh, in all three of the first editions of Mage, uh, there are examples in the published books of uh, Batini's Hermetics and other mages who said, I'm going to learn about the Nefandi so that I can fight them better. And then they get corrupted and they become Nefandi or they become tools of the Nefandi. And so there's this idea in our mage books of uh, perhaps there are things that you shouldn't mess with. I mean, where, what is the dividing line between confidence and pride? The verbena, for example, would say, look, there's gods out there. Um, you don't, even if you don't bow to them, at least stay out of their way. Whereas you know, the traditional hermetic thinking is, uh, oh, there are gods out there? Well, I'm going to study hard and I'm going to become a god and I'm going to push them around. And is that wise? Um, I, I think that's an interesting idea to play with. I think there's things to be said on both sides of that discussion. So I, I think it would be cool for storytellers to bring that into uh, a hermetic-focused uh, chronicle, but certainly not in the first couple of sessions. Let, let that work in over time. That's something to treat with subtlety, but I'd certainly like to play with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what did you think about the, uh, the book overall? Well, generally speaking... I never agreed with the idea that Doisetep was the only chantry worth mentioning, and it was the concentration of hermetic power. Uh, I think that the Order of Hermes would have had other chantries that were important and where powerful things were going on. And I remember when I read Book of Chantries, there were a lot of non-hermetic mages living there and, and who were members of important cabals there. So, yeah... All three of the first editions of Mage after the Book of Chantries, they seem to fall into this default thinking that Horizon Chantry and Doisetep Chantry are both very powerful, they're worth talking about, and none of the other Chantries are big enough to even be worth mentioning. I, I don't agree with that. I didn't like to see that done again and again. Uh, this book really emphasizes throwing off dogma and the traditions of the past, but in the process, it risks forgetting core beliefs. Uh, one of the hermetic ideas that we've seen in previous published books is that hermetics believe that all mystic knowledge was once known by educated people, and it has been lost and it must be recovered. So if young hermetics are going to say, let's, let's throw off the uh, hindrances and formalities of the past and go for what's good, well, are the young people in any position to make those calls? Can the young people look at this old material and really do a good job of telling the good stuff from the bad stuff? I would question that. I think there is uh, some utility in having older people around who have known this stuff for a long time who can say, yeah, this, this stuff was an obstacle for you know bright young minds to conquer, but this other stuff is actually core to our beliefs. Don't, don't throw that out. So uh, I, th I think that's something worth considering when you talk about young people throwing off the uh, hindrances of the past. Also, I want to just say thank you, Brill Bill Bridges. This tradition book took us out of the coffee shop. There was no <laughs> mention of coffee shops anywhere in here. Apparently, the Order of Hermes has realized there are other places where majors can congregate. So I thought that was just Like totally nuclear cool power because... plants and libraries. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> nuclear power plants. But I have heard so much about coffee shops and revised editions that I am just ready to step out of the coffee shop and see what else we've got in this city. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, authors and uh, Bill Bridges, for doing that. I think this book didn't do a good enough job of emphasizing the accomplishment of the Order of Hermes, and that is uh, the Order of Hermes created a mystic society where mages had motivations and had systems in place to help them to cooperate, to become more trustful of each other, to reduce conflicts and reduce the rate at which mystical knowledge was being lost. I, I think the Order of Hermes made a, a real contribution to the world, and their model is worth at least looking at by other uh, groups of mages. And so this book, I, I think it made a passing reference to it at one point, but I think that's worth giving more emphasis to. Yeah, those are my general thoughts uh, when looking over this book. I enjoyed the fact that it we got kind of a hermetic creation story. Adam found it to be religious. I thought it was an interesting case where it was taking a religious story and hermetifying it, like hermetificating it, to use it as a term. I, I generally have enjoyed when the books do that, where they say, this is another paradigm. How do we hermeticate it? And I, I find that process to be uh, interesting on the whole. It's interesting you see it as a hermeticization of religious ideas. I was expecting to see that in the book and was disappointed when I didn't. If I understand the idea correctly, hermeticizing religion is taking religious doctrine and interpreting it as metaphors that pass along useful teachings about the universe but are not literally true. 
After reading chapter one, it struck me as being written by someone who not only accepted Kabbalah and Gnosticism as a true believer, but was devoted to them. If the author was trying to show the hermeticization of concepts from those two belief systems, I wish he would have made it more clear. I like the fact that it talked about, yes, the Order of Hermes has done great things, but in many cases, those were ultimately self-serving. It was through the quest of power or the desire to be shut up in a tower. Uh, the The metaphor that they use of the, the tower within the Order, I really like that as a recurring motif. I thought that was uh, good writing and uh, good use of kind of parallel structure. I enjoyed talking that, that they talked frankly about their failures as well as uh, some of their successes it does kind of move quickly through the founding i guess i mean we did get horizon stronghold of hope but as adam says you got to give yourself some props for that uh, especially like the work that the hermetics also did like during world war ii which kind of only gets a passing men mention there um I, I guess the book is very much focusing on uh, how a lot of the accomplishments may not have actually budged the line in terms of uh, achieving ascension and wisdom. Uh, it's it's a big, dense book that has a bunch of options. Maybe dense isn't the right word. It's a big, packed book that has a lot of options. Uh, if anyone walks away with a stereotype of the Order of Hermes and thinks that it is accurate, I think this book does a good job of dispelling that notion. Uh, we get a few references to the idea of Pymander as a metaphor that people are going to go around. And that's, that's my thought. If you're playing a Hermetic, it's really hard not to recommend somebody grab this. Uh, the first edition one is good if you have songs of science it is part of that compilation but uh, this is a book that even if you're not using the revised meta plot i think it has a lot of useful information and is really great if you are um so yeah that's kind of my my, my overall thoughts on things okay well i had uh, three story ideas that i wanted to share before we move towards our uh, wrap up Number one, the remaining Kriamon mages, now recognized as members of House Ex Miscellinea, have recovered from the severe quiet they came under at the start of the Avatar Storm. Also, the Hermit of Doisetep, an aged Kriamon thought killed at the fall of Doisetep, just appeared at a Hermetic Chantry. They announced the Council of the Sphinx has fallen from grace. The Sphinx will hand the scepter to those who retrieve it from the former counselors who hide between the Tigris and the Euphrates. As Hermetic leaders discuss this, rumors begin of Rogue Council messages becoming traceable. The Order wants the players to investigate quickly. Are the secrets of the Rogue Council about to come out, or are the Kriamon mages long known for their cryptic visions having trouble unraveling their own riddles? Number two. Tired of hearing arguments and criticism, the leadership of the Order of Hermes has decided the covenant recaptured from the Tremere vampires in Budapest, Hungary, cannot be ignored any longer. Six Hermetic mages have been living there peacefully for months, but many fear traps laid by the vampires. The players are sent to prepare the massive and well-appointed complex to be a new chantry. Leading a group of sorcerers and talented kustos, the players are assured it's an honor. After being impressed by the resources and luxuries of the place, the players find signs of a spirit gate that was kept shut with potent rituals long before the place fell to the Hermetics. A wraith walks the halls at night, but is willing to talk to the players. It explains few vampires used to dwell there, and only because their leader demanded it. Being already dead, they sometimes fell prey to things sneaking past the ward. The wraith claims the lord of the obsidian tower in the low umbra will... Uh, still respect his old pacts with the order, and renewing it would stop the intruding wraiths. If the wraith can be trusted, this would open a significant new resource for the order. If it can't be trusted, the players might open Pandora's other box. Number three, a talented hermetic adept recently returned from a high-risk trip to the Umbra. She claims to have rescued valuable records from the hermetic college near Mercury. The players are sent to retrieve the records, but find her sanctum empty and scorched by fire. Careful examination shows traces of magical travel. Following this trail leads the players to a copy of the sanctum in the penumbra, where the adept is deep in the throes of quiet. Each room of the sanctum holds the adept engaged with one of the things she gave up for the Order of Hermes. The first room is an office where the adept remembers rewarding moments from a university job she never started. The next, she's surrounded by moments in the lives of children she never had. Next is romantic getaways with a husband she never met, etc. The emotion from each invented memory overwhelms the players unless they can find a way to cope. The promised records can't be found unless the adept is brought out of quiet. Can the players convince the adept she made the right choice sacrificing her life for the order? Can they convince themselves of the same thing? Can they do it before the fragile sanctum breaks up? 
Well, those are three story ideas I thought I'd toss out there. And if they give you story ideas of your own, uh, then they did their job. And certainly uh, write us in to tell us about that. And uh, Terry, was there a closing quote for us today? Yeah, this was uh, peppered in a few bits of writing that I thought were particularly good. I thought the writing in general was on point for this book. The section that talked about the trinity, as it were, of Christoval, Porthos, and Mustai, I thought was pretty fascinating. And I thought the section on Porthos really brought the saga of Porthos Fitz Empress into focus, where it said, Master Porthos was the diplomat. Though half mad and occasionally murderous, he had an eye on the future and kind words for the young. It has been said that his tottering sanity came from self-awareness. Porthos knew his age and power drew him further from ascension, yet he pursued it with missionary zeal. In that pursuit, he became all that he saw hindering our tradition. But still, he knew that if he faltered, other masters would take his place and probably do worse." And if that's not a summary of the entirety of the Path of Thorns towards Ascension, I don't really know what is. So um, it, it's hard not to keep that in mind when you think about a tale of, uh, of hubris and the perils of uh, failing. Uh, so what are we reading next, Adam? Next up is uh, Forged by Dragon's Fire, a book that offers to uh, expand the rules on wonders, which I thought were, were pretty detailed already. So we'll see what that has to offer. Nice. You want to take us out? Well, if you have uh, something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review of Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in their searches. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. This episode is thanks to executive producers Josh H., John Magnuson, uh, Jenna F., John H., Chris Zach, William M., Neil Patterson, Christopher, Buck Farmer, Anders S., Brandon, Dan Svensson, Jay Sunsern, Andrew E., William C., Isabel Castillo, Josh Golden, Michael Credle, Freddie, Richard Bat Brewster, Bryce Perry, Andy, and Michael Parker. If you would like to become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast, it would help us keep producing episodes like this one. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Go crack down the edifice of the Fortress of Hermes and liberate its contents or die trying. Bye. <laughs>